Hey there, Captain. Do you enjoy the idea of manning your very own spaceship to traverse the stars? Do you enjoy the idea of <clears throat> defending yourself from pirates, rebels, and other space entities that are conveniently not protected by the Geneva Convention? Do you have mild to severe autism? I know I do. And if any of those things applied to you, if you're anything like me, you'll probably love Faster Than Light. Faster Than Light is a spaceship simulation roguelike-like, where you are the captain of your very very own Federation starship. With the help of your tech and your trusty crew, you can fly from planet to planet, help peaceful alien life, combat those who try to disrupt that peace, and boldly go where no man has gone before. Well, that's the ideal, anyway. Unfortunately for you, Captain, you happen to be on the losing side of a war. The Federation is losing its grip to a rebellion, and you're deep in what's quickly becoming rebel territory. But Varok, I hear you cry. Why are the rebels taking over? Are they Justified? Who exactly are the good guys here? <laughs> <laughs> Captain, Captain, you know better. You went through the same Federation Academy training that I did. Don't ask questions. The premise of Faster Than Light is simple and to the point. You have information that will lead to the downfall of the Rebellion. Information that cannot be transferred by wireless communications, apparently, and you're a long way from home. Make it to the Federation base in one piece and tell them what you know before it's too late. The Federation has lost a lot of ground in this war already. They've retreated all the way to their home base in Sector 8 and you're in Sector 1. It's a perilous journey, Captain. The rebels will be chasing from behind, and the things in front of us aren't much nicer. There are pirates, violent mantis people, violent mantis pirates, and slug things, and glowing hippie space vegans. Ugh. But if you survive to the end, you'll take on the final challenge, the rebel flagship. The information you carry suggests that destroying this flagship will cripple the rebel fleet. Take this massive lad out in three phases, Captain, and you'll be a hero. Get taken out yourself, which might happen a lot, and you'll have to start from the beginning. The destination of Faster Than Light is the final boss, and it's an intense and engaging fight. But the journey there can be even more fun and memorable, and that's where Faster Than Light excels. Even if you fail in your mission, there's always plenty of fun things to explore and experience along the way. The goal is always the same, to make it to the end and beat the boss, but the strategy you use to get there can be different every single time. Upgrade your weapon system to utilize a powerful arsenal that can cut across entire ships. Or next time, teleport your bloodthirsty bug people directly into the enemy captain's bedroom. Or roleplay Jeff Bezos and hurl your Amazon drones straight through the walls of their ship. The game's about a decade old now, but with all these ways to play and with literally hundreds of random events to experience, I keep coming back to it. This game deserves more attention and I am here to provide. I love Faster Than Light. You should play it, and I want to tell you why. First thing you'll do is start a new game and choose your vessel. Part of Faster Than Light's replayability comes from its variety of playable ships. There's ten of them to choose from, and each ship has two or three individual variations on top of that. Most ships can be unlocked by simply beating the game. Every ship comes equipped with different weapons, too. Usually either lasers, missiles, or beams, but more on weapons later. Some ships, instead of traditional weaponry, are built with the intent of boarding hostile ships, attacking them with drones, or bombs that cause fires, or anti-bio laser weapons that don't even damage ships, they specifically just fucking murder people. But let's not kid ourselves, I've never read the Geneva Convention, and neither have you, so I'm sure it's fine. The variations of each ship are unlocked by achievements specific to that ship. For example, the Mantis Cruiser has achievements primarily relating to crew-on-crew -crew melee combat, because the Mantis are bloodthirsty maniacs who deal the most melee damage in the game. But until you unlock some other options, you'll be starting with the Kestrel. You may notice that other ships you unlock come with augmentations as well. These are based on the ship's lore. To use the Mantis as an example again, the Mantis Cruiser comes equipped with Mantis Pheromones as a ship augmentation. With this augmentation, everyone on the ship is constantly breathing in those pheromones, making them 25% faster and 25% hornier for giant bugs. Up to you how you deal with that, Captain. Each ship also comes with crew members of varying alien races. The one thing they have in common is that they can operate and man the systems of your ship to enhance your vessel's capabilities, Captain. And the longer you have them manning 
using that system, the better they'll get at it. You'll want to protect your skilled crew members, Captain. They may be strange-looking alien weirdos that eat metal, rocks, and sometimes other people, but understanding their quirks and differences will be vital to succeeding in your mission. So I'm gonna run them all by you real quick. Welcome to Verox-plaining, where I aggressively explain video games to unsuspecting women. You may notice there isn't a woman with me today. She's fine. She's right over there. Hi. That's because this time, you're the woman I'm gonna Verox-plain to. How does it feel, huh? How do you like it? All right, calm down, you degenerate. You don't have to get that into it. Now, you may be wondering, if you're the one I'm going to Verox-plain to, how is this segment different from any of the rest of the video? <laughs> Good question, baby. It's not. Humans! The game describes humans as common and uninteresting. They're the baseline for stats in the game, and their only specialty is learning skills slightly faster than other races. But when you're sitting in the captain's chair, surrounded by your crew full of specialized alien weirdos that only do one thing particularly well? Don't come crying to the humans wishing you had someone who could do many things particularly mediocre. Angie! In the grim darkness of the far future, nanomachines have gained sentience and taken the form of a walking toaster with a cock gun. But with human lungs, because despite being robots, they can still choke to death if you lock them in a room without oxygen. Don't ask me how I know that. NG repair twice as fast as everybody else, so they're great to have in a pinch when your ship takes damage. But the nanomachines that make up the NG's bodies never figured out how to properly make a fist. They do not harden in response to physical trauma. NG deal half damage in melee combat, and every other species easily steals their lunch money because of it. Mantis! These guys are the ones stealing the NG's lunch money. Mantis are a little bit faster than everybody else and deal the most damage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. However, they are terrible at repairs and cannot be relied on to fix anything. Mantis slaver ships often have an NG on them for this very reason, because, as it turns out, nanobot hands can fix things faster than bug hands with no fingers. Rockmen! Much like some of the redneck friends I had in high school, Rockmen are tanky, rectangularly shaped, a little slow, and immune to fire. A diet of pure bush light drilled fresh from the Rockmen homeworlds has made these guys bloated, immovable objects. They have 150 health instead of 100 and are great in a bar fight, as long as the fight comes to them. Don't ask them to run anywhere. They don't know how. Drinking bush light may be good for bulking and maybe makes you immune to fire, but it does not make you good at cardio. Zoltan! The only glow glowing energy beings in the universe that somehow aren't feds. The Zoltan are the most useful crew members you can have in terms of energy management, because they provide a free bar of power to whatever system of your ship they're standing in. Their only real downside is that they're fairly squishy. Although they do regular damage in combat, they only have 70 health. Because of this, you generally want them manning and powering important systems while avoiding combat. However, they also explode when they die. So, if you want to get wacky with your three-letter agents, get a a clone bay and a teleporter. Then enjoy your rotating door of exploding glowies deposited directly inside the enemy's walls. <laughs> Slug. Don't trust them. Don't let them on your ship. I don't care. Oh, they can. They, they can't get mind control. Oh, they can see things without sensors. Every fucking ship has sensors. Don't go to the slug world, Nebulas. They're gonna bend you over when nobody can see you. And then they're gonna <laughs> Lanius! The Lanius do not play well with others. And by others, I specifically mean people who need to breathe air to live. C -c 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 crystal <laughs> These guys are the long-lost cousins of the Rockmen. The most notable feature of the Crystal Men is that they are the only crew members in the game with an active ability called Lockdown. Activating Lockdown barricades the room they're in with crystals, preventing anybody from getting in or out for 12 seconds. Hey, Brick Joe! You're going nowhere! I got you for three minutes! Three minutes of bleak time! Anyway, it's time to head out on your mission, Captain, so pick a ship and give it a name. You use one fuel every time you jump from one of these points on the map. The rebels are going to be encroaching from the left and slowly taking over the entire sector every time you make a jump. But the idea here is to get as many chances to encounter random events and combats as you can. These moments will give you chances to gain scrap, aka that fat cash, as well as weapons, extra crew members, and as many other resources as possible. So you want to visit as many points on the map as you can before you hit the exit without the rebels touching you, and without wasting fuel by visiting the same points repeatedly if you can help it. How fast will the rebels approach? Well, they'll get about that 
get much closer every time you jump. But Varrock, I hear you cry. How do you measure that distance that the rebel fleet approaches precisely? How do I know for sure how many jumps I can make? I'm glad you asked, Captain. I use a very methodical scientific method, sometimes referred to in Latin by our experts as eyeballing it. Do your best, Captain. But don't worry, if you do land on a point on the map that's controlled by the rebel fleet, it's not the end of the game. You're just in for a tough fight where you're almost guaranteed to take some chip damage. The speed of the rebel fleets can be delayed slightly by traveling through areas covered in nebula. Take advantage of these when needed, but keep in mind that it's sort of like taking a shortcut through the back alley. It's dark, your sensors won't work, so it's hard to see, but you'll probably make it out the other end unscathed with some time saved. But it's a risk, because there's always a chance that an ion storm will disable your shields, and then a slug person will violate your anus. So pick your route, Captain, and good luck. We're all counting on you. Along your journey, you're going to encounter a myriad of planets and other ships that want things from you. For example, you arrive to a planet that is in extreme distress. Why? Well, giant alien spiders. If you ask me, they're failing to turn lemons into lemonade here, but let's not worry about that for a second. You can decide to help them or refuse. If you refuse, you gain nothing, but you also lose nothing. If you try to help, you could gain precious scrap and resources you need for your journey. But you may also lose a man to a broken pelvis. Faster Than Light is filled with situations like these, and they're your decisions to make, Captain. This is just one of the simpler ones. You'll learn as you play that these random events can sometimes have special blue options. For example, if you have an anti-bio beam, you can solve the planet spider problem with no risk, just pure reward. You'll get these blue options for having things like a specific weapon, a specific specific race of alien crew member, or even a certain level of upgraded system. For example, certain random events reward you for having an NG on board who can explain to you that the two ships smashing together that you just encountered are not fighting, but simply engaging in a steamy mechanical union. In the missionary position with the lights off and their sensors closed, just like the Omnisaya intended. Because of your NG's knowledge, you'll be rewarded for knowing better and not interrupting them. But basically, you'll have a lot of choices to make. If you're indecisive, you could always look up every choice and its consequences on the internet. That is, if you were a little... bitch. Of course you're not, though, because you're watching this video. Another important aspect of Faster Than Light's exploration is something I'll refer to as resource management. Sounds exciting, I know. Bro, you play the latest COD? It's got crazy resource management. Yes, dude! Ugh! Scrap metal is gained by beating other ships in combat or as a positive result from random events, and it serves two purposes, as currency and as the building blocks of your ship. As currency, scrap is used reliably at stores and unreliably in in random events. There's usually a couple stores per sector, sometimes more. You'll see them if you're one jump away from them, just like distress signals. Stores will always have the basic resources available for purchase, like fuel, missiles, drones, and the repair service to heal your ship. You can sell items to them as well, at a fraction of the cost, if you need a little bit of extra cash. But the rest of their selection is randomized. You might be able to buy a weapon or a drone schematic. You could even pick up one of the many laborers waiting outside this space home depot. Some of them have skills, and some don't, but they're not priced based on that. In Faster Than Light, people are priced based on the inherent value of their race. <laughs> all humans cost the same, all Zoltan cost the same, and so on. This human here is Brian. He's got a fifth grade reading comprehension and no discernible talents, but boy, you pay that 45 scrap and he'll be yours for life. But let's say you've got a lot of scrap and that there's no stores in sight. You already passed a couple of them and they're too far gone now. The rebels already got to them. They're selling them cold hot dogs and NG slaves or whatever. In this case, you should use the scrap to tune up your own ship, Captain. Specifically, scrap is used to upgrade systems of your ship, like the piloting, the doors, or any other room with something in it. Every system gains higher benefits the more it's up Upgraded. So upgrade your shields and make yourself impenetrable. Or upgrade your engines instead. Remain still tantalizingly penetrable, but harder for the enemy to try to penetrate in the first place. Or upgrade your weapons so that you can violently penetrate the enemy first before they can do it to you. But importantly, always remember to upgrade your reactor, the thing that gives your ship power. Or else you won't be able to get these systems up in the first place. You should be upgrading your systems frequently. If you get lucky, you may even encounter certain random events where you can get a deal 
deal on an upgrade at a steal of the price. But with all these upgrades to make and Home Depot stragglers to buy, how am I gonna get enough scrap, Varrock? Well, like I said, dear Captain, you can get scrap by solving people's problems and trying to help them when they throw up the distress beacon and random events and all that good stuff. But there's a more lucrative method of gaining scrap and faster than light. A secret only the pros know about, Captain, called incredible violence. Faster than light will reward you for a healthy amount of psychopathy, but don't feel too bad about it. Any life form you encounter that's sentient enough to pilot a ship is sentient enough to aim a missile at you. Even if they do give you an option to simply leave, they still could attack you, and that's all the justification you need to defend yourself, Captain. Mostly because there's scrap and rewards at the end of each combat, so it's worth picking a lot of fights. But feel no remorse about it, Captain, even if you need to shoot a beam through a crowd of alien babies in a fleet to ensure your safety. Wink. Enemy combatants will often plead for their lives when their ship reaches low health. Usually, a surrender reward will have a higher proportion of fuel, missiles, and drone parts than the reward you get for simply blowing them up. But blowing them up gets you more scrap. Rarely, a surrendering ship will offer an item with their plea deal. This is almost always worth taking because you can sell the item for a large amount of scrap on top of what they're already giving you. Or use it, of course, if possible. But usually, you'll want to ignore their cries and just blow them up. Don't worry, they're just pirates. Or rebels, or bystanders, I don't know, they're not part of the Federation, not our problem. What's more, is there's actually an even higher reward for finishing combat by killing the entire crew instead of just blowing their ship up. Easier to gather resources from a ship that isn't in multiple pieces, after all. Just don't mind the multiple pieces of the eviscerated people you'll need to step over to achieve this. Most weapons are projectiles, which always have a chance of missing, but the traits vary from there. Another offensive option is the teleporter. Equip this system to your ship, and you'll be able to send your own crew members to the enemy ship to murder them with their own hands. Drones can be used offensively as well as defensively. There are drones that shoot down projectiles, and others that'll help you repair systems. There are even ones that'll help you combat intruders. Speaking of combating intruders, let's talk about the most powerful system in the game. It's called... Doors! Now, for people who haven't played Faster Than Light before, I know what you're thinking. Varrock, how could doors be the most powerful defensive tool when I literally could have a robot that kills people? Well, let me show you a very common example. Pirates board your ship. They attack your systems. They attack your men. You gotta do something about this, Captain. See these funny little doors that connect to the outside? They're called airlocks. I think you see where I'm going with this. Basically, upgrade your doors once or twice and throw one of your guys in the door system to really lock things down when you need to. With that, you can then funnel your intruders around like a little ant farm as the vacuum of space chases them. And you'll never need to throw a punch. Now that's the most important system, but the most important tool, your most important strategic option in the entire game, both offensive and defensive. It's equipped on every single ship in the game, but only the pros know how to use it. I'm gonna tell you about it, Captain. I'm gonna blow your mind right now. So take your biggest, strongest finger and slap it down on the space bar. It's a pause button. It pauses the game. You can plan out all your actions while paused. Aim your weapons, move your men around to other rooms. The enemy can't do anything about it. Captain, we can't play fair. That rebel fleet doesn't accept surrender, and we don't accept making any real-time decisions. Faster Than Light is a fantastic game. It is perfect in its simplicity. The indie dev team that made it, Subset Games, went on to make another great game after this called Into the Breach, which happens to have a couple of Faster Than Light Easter eggs hidden within it. I recommend Into the Breach as well, and I'd wager to say it's as well designed and fun as Faster Than Light is. So maybe I'll cover that game someday too. Subset Games has only made two titles, and they're both golden. That's a 100% win rate, baby. For as many hours as I've played and enjoyed it, Faster Than Light is worth a lot more than $10. Buy it, play it, and enjoy commanding your starship, Captain. Try not to blow up too many times, but even if you do, you'll have fun while doing it. Faster Than Light is great. I highly recommend it. Thanks for watching, everyone. I like Faster Than Light a lot, and I hope I've done it some justice with this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it too. And a special thank you to my shady cabal of video elites and connoisseurs. Your blood money funds production of these videos. There's been so many of you joining lately that I actually have to talk a little more here to make the credit section longer because I want to make sure that you all get the screen time you deserve. It's a wonderful problem to have, so thank you all. I love you all very much. Thanks again, and see you next time.
Thank you.